now continuing with our discussion let's see a full read path now that we know how our disk is laid out we know what are the contents we are storing on the disk at which place we know how to reach to this content so we with an example we saw once we have i node number how do we reach to that and then once we reach to the i node structure from i node structure how do we actually reach to our data let's take a practical example where we see what happens when a read request comes so let's say the read request is for bar file stored inside the foo directory and foo is stored inside the root where this file system is mounted so first thing what happens is definitely we need to read the root inode once we read the root inode then that inode structure will have pointer to where the data related to this um root file is stored so we read that data root data once we read the root data this data of this directory is storing what does the data that usually a directory stores it stores the name of file or the directory and the inode number so the data over here in the root data will have information about what inode does the file foo, does the folder foo points to like folder foo and folder foo's inode so then we go back to foo inode fetch that data go go back to the go back to our inode table read that foo inode when we read the foo inode from this foo inode structure we get an information about the pointer to the foo data so we read the foo data again foo is a directory so foo is storing the same same information about all the files and the name of all the files and directory inside this directory and their respective inodes so from the foo data we get the bar inode we read the bar inode and with this steps now as we are able to access the bar inode we have opened the bar file after opening the file we want to read this file and then we would just close this file right open read write close these are create read write close these are the most frequent operations done on any file system so in order to read this file first we would read the block of that files inode once we read the block of that file inode depending upon the underlying data structure either we are using direct pointers multi level index or um, chaining mechanism or contiguous extends depending upon how um, in our file system how do we design a mechanism for, to reach to the location of data from inode we would be able to go and read the bars data now once we read the bars data then we would have to come back to the bar inode maybe because to update some information like when was this file last accessed if this is an information that stored inside an inode then this counter would change so we we could have a write inside the bar bars inode but with this right finally we would be able to read the bar file now does this complete the access to the bar file no the bar file could range over multiple blocks so this process of reading the inode block going to its data and modifying the inode block by changing the metadata entries as per required that would continue until let's say if the bar file is ranging over 3 blocks 
then we would have to repeat it three times. So the same process, we will then first read the inode block, bar inode, then go to the data block, then come back and update the inode block. That would continue. So with this, we, were, we are then able to open the bar file by parsing through the directory and read the bar file. What if we have a write? So now what if we want to open a file, create a file, write a file, and then close, maybe create and write. Those are the operations that we want to do. So if we want to create the bar file and write the bar file, then as we discussed above, we have these sets of operations. I want you to take some time and try to digest this list of operations yourself. So make a mental model of what is happening right from this diagram. Take your time to do that. Okay, so I think it's clear to you now how this process of creating a file and writing a file is working. If you have any questions, uh, please drop me an email or see me in my office apps. So in this process, we learned how do we make and manage files um, how do we have, uh, in most of our examples, we took examples of files while uh, discussing the structure of inode and how to locate that. What about directories? In this both read and write examples that we just saw, we are accessing this foo directory, right? Um, how, are there any other challenges that managing directory would give to us that we may not encounter while we design mechanisms to manage files. Quite not, at least I cannot think of. So maybe you can give some more thoughts to that. If you can come up with challenges, we could discuss that. But usually directories are very simplified version. So if we have mechanisms that works for files, there is a big variance of file size and the content, actual data is stored inside the files. While directories are just notion of um, where the content is being located to and where it could be pointed back from. So directories just store the information about mm, the files and the other directories and their respective inodes inside them. So directories are usually simpler than files. Um, 
we could store things just like the entry name and inode number, as we saw in this example, foo directory is just storing the entry name, root and foo directory, both of them, they are just storing the entry name, such as root is storing foo's entry name and it's storing what inode number is foo is located, located at, and then foo is storing entry name for the file bar and it's storing where this file bar is located. Apart from that, as we already know, um, and all the directories have these two additional entries where dot that signifies the current directory and dot dot signifies the parent directory. And directory may also contain number of blocks of each file. It depends on how we want to design, it, design our directory data structure. But basically, it's still much more lesser than the information that we have to uh, maintain for a file data structure. So um, a data structure that efficiently manages file metadata is good enough to manage directory metadata as well. Now, where exactly the directories are stored? They are treated as just the special files where the type of these files or type of these inodes that are storing directory could, could be marked as something like directory. Than the regular file. With such a minor modification, we could do further optimization depending on how much space do we give to this and so on and so forth. But it has this data block pointed by inode in data. Um, and so it has a data block. Pointed to by inode. in data block region same as file where all the information is stored. So the management could be done same as how we manage files but the information that we store for directory is way more simple than the information that we store for file. And this information just include the entries and it includes so entries could be files or directories inside that directory and it's inode number. Um, so managing directories, well, if we know how to manage files efficiently, then we can use the same mechanisms to manage directory as well. Um, depending on different file systems, um, such as XFS file system, it uses B trees to manage its directory structure. So um, we could use, depending upon the utility that we find for the workload that we have in the system, we could use different data structures to manage directories, to manage files, or we could use the same data structure to manage both of them. But if we want to use the same data structure to manage both of them, the data organization mechanisms that works for files would definitely work for directories. Now, um, learning all those basic ways of making or creating our file system, what and after um, going through this read and write paths, what do you think is the biggest IO cost? Or what do you think is a performance killer? From this both read and write path, we see that there is a lot of back and forth, right? We have to go to a data region, then we have to come back to inode region. We have to go to the bitmap region. And we know that in the way that how we are storing information on our disk, we have all these regions as separated 
over an actual that all these regions will be separated quite far over an actual disk. So going um, like this back and forth of accessing the data region and then the inode region and then the bitmap region and then again the data region, all this is causing a lot many many seeks and and rotations if it's in hard disk. And we know that seeks and additional seeks and additional rotations are doing no good to us because they are not productive. They're not contributing towards our data transfer time. Like, so our data transfer time could be very small, but this additional latencies of seek and rotation could be very high. So overall data access time could be considerably larger than the time that we are actually doing fruitful work of transferring the data. So such an organization is very simple, very easy to manage. And we could design such a file system with less lines of code, but it's not quite efficient. And it's leading to all this um, additional seeks, additional rotations to manage. That's one of the disadvantage. Now, how to reduce the file system IO cost for this system? So here in the read and write path, we see that uh, we need to do mm, many IOs just to read small amount of data from the inode for read and also to read small amount of, to access small amount of data about the free space from the bitmap. Um, now, if this, the size of the bitmap and the size of the inode is not that big, then probably one way to reduce the file system cost, coming back to our slides, our pages. So the question that we want to think of is how do we reduce file system IO costs? We see that many IOs are happening right in, in the write and read path that we just saw with that example. So what are the proposed solution? So if one of the solution could be that if those metadata structures are not that big, then why not just cache them? So caching. Now, whenever a write is happening, if we have to do like a whole, big the seek that takes lots of time and then a rotation that still takes lot of lots of time just to write a single bit like let's say a write that's happening inside the bitmap something like that um, or if the file is very small then if we have to do all this um, seek and rotation just for that small amount of data that we have to write so why not just buffer that so we can use a buffer where we can accumulate multiple writes and then go to the disk and do all those right at once. So caching and buffering. Two big boons, right? We can, with uh, for caching and buffering, we could use DRAM where we have different techniques such as static partitioning, where fixed size cache for file system pages is allocated or in a more advanced way of caching and buffering we could do dynamic partitioning in dynamic partitioning we have unified page cache for virtual memory pages and file system pages. Depending on runtime needs.
So um, this use of DRAM towards caching, we can improve our read performance and we can use buffering such as we can have write buffers. Where I would say laziness is the virtue. So we are lazy to put the rights that we received just now, as soon as we receive it, to go go take it to the disk and put it in the, to the disk. But rather we wait for a while saying that, well, let me wait, I might get some more rights. And then once I have good amount of rights, at once I would go take all those rights to the disk. So that would ensure that we spend the amount of time that we spend to transfer the data is um, qualitative enough with respect to the amount of time that we take to seek and rotate and find the free space and all that. So uh, using write buffer is nothing but wait and batch some IOs and then at once flush those IOs to the disk. This will help us to improve the write performance. But again, um, there is a risk in using write buffer. What if um, there is a power crash in between the time that we were able to flush that to the disk and the, the time that the write arrived? In that case, we would miss those, the most recent updates before we flush that. Pros and cons, again, a trade-off, and that's the part and parcel of system designers life, right? So these approaches will help us to improve the read and write performance for the large number of IOs that we saw in the read and write path over here. Are there any other ideas of further how we can improve this? Well, as we see over here in this slide, we have two big problems. First, data blocks allocated randomly in aging file system. That is, let's say if we have if we have files A, B, and C stored over different blocks. So each of them occupies two blocks. File A, file B. Let's say file C is small. File D is again, it occupies two blocks. File C occupies just one. Now, out of initially, we had these files and they were stored inside the disk in this fashion. But now, let's say um, file C and file A got deleted. In that case, now this will be a free block. These two will be a free block. But in the simplistic file system that we designed, what would happen is now this free block will remain free. We still have the entry of this free block in our bitmap. But now when we, if we have a new file, which is file E, which needs three blocks. So we have E1, E2, E3, like which needs three blocks of space. The mechanism in which we will be able to, like if we manage our data structures wisely, then we would be able to store this file E as E1 here, E2 here, and E3 here. Now, every time when we want to access this file E or read this file E, we would have to do the seek and rotation latencies to first read this two part and then this one. So what we are doing here is we are spoiling the sequentiality of um, method in which we are storing the data, right? Like file E could be stored in a consecutive blocks and then we could leverage the sequentiality benefits. But here we are introducing additional seek and rotate latencies apart from just locating the file, apart from just locating the beginning of this file to like, again, if this file is chunked into different, into different places, then every time we have to like, okay, read the first part of the file, then again, do a seek, again, do a rotate, then read the second part of the file. And this just reading the single file would take much more time than how much it would actually take if the single file was stored in a consecutive blocks. 
So um, as this, as we age uh, over the, con as the content stored over this disk age, this problem would increase more and more because different files would be deleted, different new files would come and, and eventually with aging, this disk would be a mess to manage. The second big problem here, what we are seeing is inodes allocated far from the block, as we just discussed, because we have a super block, bitmap, inodes, and then the data blocks. Every time we want to access something in the data block versus something in the inode, we have to go back and forth, and back and forth inside the disk means many um, seeks, many rotations. Again, lot of additional overhead. So for those two different overheads that we have, we discussed, well, in a way we could use caching and write buffering um, to reduce the fragmentation and to reduce the read latency. Um, but is that the entire solution? Can we come up with a mechanism to ensure that the way in which we are storing the data is a bit more organized and we can have like a bit more, we can leverage the sequentiality benefit of a large file. So when like file like E3 comes, we can somehow um, rearrange the content inside this disk and say that, okay, B1 and B2 are stored in the first two blocks, then I have D1 and D2 in the next two blocks, and then we have three blocks that in which now E file E could be stored. So that now if we have multiple recurrent reads to file E, in that case, we will be uh, definitely much more in, in a much more better situation than what we would be in this fragmented case. Is there a solution that you could think of? Well, to give a clue, take the inspiration from the concepts that we discussed for SSD. Particularly if we store the data in a log structured manner, what happens then? That's your clue. I would give you a minute to think about that. Okay, so devil is in the details, right? Just understanding the general idea and not bothering yourself to nail down the details of that would just give you this empty box impression of you understand the concept, but then um, you do not know how to make that idea work. So nailing down all those details is very important. In our case, every detail is and is raised from a hierarchy of problems. And each problem has its new solution and the solution that we propose can have again further problems. So that's the details we have to nail things down to. So this notion of somehow being able to do better is now let's divide that into two different um, operations. First, we are doing reads. Second, we are doing writes. Now, for reads, 